Welcome to Citizen University TV. I'm Eric Liu. On this show all season long, we've been looking at the question, what is civics? And we define civics a very simple way. It is the art of being a pro-social, problem-solving contributor in a self-governing community. All three of those elements are important, pro-social, problem-solving, and self-governing. Over the arc of the season, we've been looking at different ways to practice civics in the life of our city, whether that is getting local government to do what you want it to do, uh, doing community organizing wherever you may live, or even running for office. But though those things may seem political, one of the things that we're going to talk about today is something that undergirds all these forms of civics, and that is the power of neighbors, activating neighbor power wherever in the city you may live. As we know, Right now, Seattle is one of the fastest growing cities in the United States. And with that growth comes this explosion of opportunity, but also this fraying of the social fabric. Seattle has always liked to think of itself as a city of neighborhoods. But when you have this kind of growth and the kind of inequality and change that's come with it, the question arises, what does it mean to be a city of neighborhood? What does it mean to actually be a neighbor to somebody else? And that question is one that is really, again, uh, we, we feel it in our bones, but we can also see it in statistics that something is changing. Uh, according to the uh, National Conference on Citizenship and Seattle City Club, they've been doing this research that tracks neighborliness and social cohesion in cities around the United States. And Seattle actually, in many cases, ranks below average uh, on questions of, do we do favors for neighbors? 50%. Trusting people uh, in your neighborhood? Uh, 59%. And talking with neighbors? 47%. Now, in the, in the national scheme of things, we rank about middle of the pack. But imagine for a moment what it would look like if each of these numbers was 20 percentage points higher, if three out of four of us was doing favors for neighbors, trusting our neighbors, and actually talking with our neighbors. That direction, that trend uh, toward uh, disengagement is something that is deeply, deeply concerning to all of us who live in this rapidly changing city. Well, one of the things that we think about now is not just Seattle, but the fact of neighborliness in the United States in general. This same theme has been arising in ways that people are feeling, again, in ways that are cultural, economic, and political. Uh, and you see it in phenomena like the uh, huge uh, success of this recent documentary about Mr. Rogers. Mr. Rogers, who embodied this old school notion of neighborliness. Uh, and people have a sense of nostalgia about that. But you have people across the left and the right. Uh, the Nebraska Republican Senator Ben Sass has written a book and recently given a bunch of speeches about the ways in which the hyperpartisanship and polarization of our national politics is fueled in great measure by loneliness and isolation and a breakdown of a sense of neighborliness. So all these trends aren't just happening in fast-growing Seattle. They're in our country right now. And the question is, what can we do about them? How can we rebuild that spirit of old Mr. Rogers' neighborliness? Well, here today, we want to talk about four things that we can do in the life of Seattle. First, know your neighbors. Second, simply ask for help. Third, do things together. And fourth, cross-pollinate. Now, I want to spend a moment talking about each one of these things. Knowing your neighbors. Now, this seems so obvious, but let's ask ourselves, do you, in fact, know your neighbors? Wherever you may live in the city, do you know the people around you? Do you know their names? Do you know their families? Do you know the things that they do, the things that they care about? Chances are the answer is no. And as we have so many newcomers here uh, who don't know each other, much less know people who've been longtime residents in the, in, in the city, that sense of fraying uh, is something that becomes self-fulfilling. Now, there are ways that we can actually uh, uh, address this. Uh, every year, there's a Seattle night out uh, in the summer uh, that invites people to organize block parties all around the city with music and fun and things that give a spirit of celebration to your, not even your neighborhood, but your micro neighborhood, your block and your particular part of a community. Uh, there are national phenomena like Queer Soup Night uh, that started in Brooklyn but are now happening all around the United States, including in Seattle, that are inviting people uh, around a particular affinity identity to come together and meet their neighbors and come find new ways to build social cohesion and social capital where they may live. Well, that idea of simply knowing your neighbors then tees up the second notion of what it means for us to activate neighbor power. And this is this, asking for help. Now again, this seems so elementary. And again, I ask you, when was the last time you asked someone for help? When was the last time you actually looked to a neighbor and said, hey, I need help doing fill in the blank. It could be something mundane, uh, like getting a, a, a load of compost uh, a, a up the steps. 
Uh, or it could be something much more complicated, like how do we deal with the fact that there's homelessness a block away from us right now, uh, and we have these competing impulses toward compassion uh, and yet worry uh, about the safety of, uh, of the neighborhood. Asking for help is something that we've got to recultivate as a habit. And there are all kinds of ways in which in our city uh, we are actually inviting people to ask for help. Uh, in Beacon Hills Food Forest, you have an environment here right now where food is grown by the community and it is open to all. So people who may have uh, a need uh, for higher nutrition, freshly grown food, can ask for help, can have an opportunity actually to get that food uh, that's grown locally in their neighborhood. But even beyond simple formal programs like that, I cannot underscore how much in our age of broken politics and mistrust everywhere we look, that that simple human act of turning to somebody and saying, can I, can I ask you for a favor? Actually sets in motion a positive feedback loop. It actually does them a favor because it gives them an invitation to get out of their own isolation and to participate in the life that we build together in community. Well, this brings me to the third thing that we can talk about here, and that is simply doing things together. Again, not rocket science, but the doing of things together, not just knowing your neighbors, not just on an occasion, uh, whether it's asking for the proverbial cup of sugar or something else like that, asking for help, but actually saying, hey, let's organize together. Let's clean up something. You look all around our city, there are efforts to clean up and refurbish playgrounds and build parks and so forth. But also beyond that, there is the work of actually uh, addressing a common problem in a community. Where I live in Madrona, a group of neighbors have come together because we've had a bad actor developer building a horrible project there that the city has had a struggle uh, trying to contain them and getting them to follow the rules. And you realize it can't just be on the city alone. Neighbors together have to organize and create a sense of, hey, we're going to do something together here. But whether it's about solving a problem or actually trying to build something affirmative, that idea of collective action builds trust in the neighborhood. You have programs all around the city, thanks to the Seattle Department of Neighborhoods to do, uh, to en and enable neighbors to adopt a street, adopt a block, adopt a part of a neighborhood for cleanups. Uh, you have this in the university district all over, the, uh, all over the city. And this map here shows different blocks in which community residents have decided to take ownership, literally, of the problem of the cleanness uh, or the lack of cleanliness uh, in that neighborhood, take ownership of the caliber and quality of life in that neighborhood. That's something that we've got to commit to doing with each other. And again, it's not rocket science, but in some ways it's harder because it requires us to say, I'm not just going to stay in my own little rut by myself. I'm going to say to this person who lives over here, this person who lives over there, hey, can we do something together? Well, finally, that brings me to this idea of cross-pollination. One of the dangers of activating neighbor power in any city, but especially in a city like ours, is that you only focus on your neighborhood and you focus on preserving, protecting what's good in your neighborhood to the exclusion of people outside. And that can lead to a kind of practice of nimbyism. It can lead to a practice of selfishness and hoarding within a neighborhood. And so one of the most basic other things that we get to do as citizens is to cross-pollinate and to circulate our relationships, our capital, our understanding. That means serving in another part of the city and getting to know people, whether it's at a food bank, a soup kitchen, whatever it might be. That means actually asking ourselves, uh, as this chart did uh, at a community gathering in Beacon Hill, what other parts of the city have you called home? Can we actually draw and make visible the connections that we, even who live right here in this part of town, have to other parts of town? There was a move afoot a few years ago to create something called sister neighborhoods, akin to the way that you have sister cities between Seattle and Kobe, Japan, or someplace in Germany. But how about having sister neighborhoods between Ballard uh, and South Park, uh, between Queen Anne and Beacon Hill? where people actually commit to getting to know each other and finding bonds of commonality and experience and shared experience across those lines of neighborhood. Cross-pollinating our knowledge, our skills, our joys, our talents, that's got to be part of the work as well. Well, this work of building on and activating the power of neighbors is so present in everything we do, but we want to give you one concrete story of a group of neighbors who, for many years now, have been doing cleanup work at the du Duwamish River and watching the ways in which, as they do that cleanup work, they build social cohesion and activate the power of neighbors. <laughs>